so thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to travel uh, to this summer school uh, for special circumstances, but I'm very happy to present you my work on graph neural network um, for the genome assembly task. And this is a joint work with um, so Lovro uh, Vrecek, uh, Martin Schmidt, and my uh, Sikik from uh, the Genome Institute uh, in Singapore, and Thomas Ryan from LMU. So here is the outline uh, of my talk. And I'm going to start by introducing the genome assembly task. OK, so what is the task? The task is, so um, any uh, living organism is going to have a genome. And what we're going to do is that we are going to take a biological sample. We will put it in a um, um, sequencing machine. And then uh, we, will, uh, we will take the output of the sequencing machine. I will come back to that. And we will reconstruct um, the genome. So it's basically um, a, sequ uh, a long uh, sequence of uh, base pairs. So if, if uh, for humans, um, it's a 3 billion um, base pairs. And for COVID-19, there will be something much smaller, like 30,000 of base pairs. Um, so why is this problem important? So um, we know the genome is the molecular code of life. So it has all the set of restrictions for organisms to live, to develop, to heal. And, uh, and, and understanding the genome is, of course, critical. This is one of the first steps to um, understand disease and fight uh, disease. So there's been a quest to reconstruct um, the first complete genome starting uh, in the 90s. Um, and in 2001, so it was announced by uh, President Bill Clinton that um, we, we were able to reconstruct the first human genome, but actually it was not completely done. There was still a, a few gaps in the genome, um, but 99.9% .9 of the genome was reconstructed. So actually last year, uh, 30, 30 years later, uh, that was the first time that um, scientists were able to reconstruct uh, a whole genome, a whole human genome without any gaps. And that was um, in the front page of, of science uh, this year. So, so the thing is, uh, no machine, no sequencing machine uh, is able to completely um, copy uh, the genome sequence in one shot. So you cannot do it because basically the genome is too long and it would break. Um, so what machines are able to do is basically to produce uh, collections of uh, subsequences of genomes that we call reads. Uh, so this is what you can see here as, a, as, a, as an illustration. And modern machines, uh, they are, the, the goal is basically trying to get longer and longer reads with uh, less and less uh, errors for, for the base pairs. So. Uh, you have, for example, PyBio hi-fi reads, and the length of the reads is between is something like 20,000 uh, base pairs, and, and it has 0.5% error in average. So it's like you know, 100 uh, errors per, per read. You have also Oxford nanopore reads. Uh, it's something around 70,000 um, base pairs. So it, it's longer than the hi-fi reads, but we may have more errors. Um, at the same time, we, when we sequence for each um, uh, for, for, for each uh, base, uh, basically we are going not only to have uh, one uh, read, but we are going to use uh, a coverage of multiple reads. So typically, uh, each pair will be covered by thirty reads. And then um, we need to solve this genome assembly problem. So so we have um, a set of reads which is completely unordered. And, and, and you can see right away that we have a combinatorial problem. So we need to reorder uh, all, all uh, overlapping reads to form the longest possible uh, sequence. And, and the problem is very hard because you have the factorial complexity uh, you know, uh, coming on. So, so n is, is basically a very huge number. Um, so it's not like you know, 50. Uh, it's something much larger. So if we take, for example, a human genome, we would have uh, 3 billion um, base pairs. The, the typical length of a read is, is 20,000. Uh, you have a depth of 30 for each base pair. You have two strands uh, for, uh, for the genome, and then two haploids coming from the mother and the father. So basically, the number of reads 
is 80 million. So that's 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 basically something that we cannot solve uh, with um, you know today computers. Um, so the thing we need to find a way to reduce the complexity of the problem, and and the first step is basically to construct um, what we call an assembly graph. So we know so we have the genome, we have all these reads produced by the sequencing machine, they are all unordered. But what we can do, we can basically looking at the overlapping reads, and then from, from there, we can construct an assembly graph. So for example, if we have this read here and this read here, the connection between number four and the read number two, you can see also some uh, command parts. So you're gonna have a connection between four and two as you can see here, and so on and so on. So naturally, um, you have a graph because you have uh, connections between overlapping uh, reads. So in genomics, this phase is called over um, the overlap phase. And this is the first step um, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, genome assembly task. So there are actually several challenges when we want to construct this assembly uh, graph. The first challenge is interspersed regions. So if you take a genome uh, and you have this read, okay, then you may have another read, which is here. So they connect to each other, they, are, they, they overlap, and they are also consecutive um, on the genome. So it, it's going to give us you know, a good connection. Maybe you know these two. The problem is you may have reads which are similar to each other, like this read and this read here, but actually they are very far away on the genome. But still you may you will have a connection because, um, because basically you will overlap this read and this read here. So this will create a long range uh, connection, which is bad because it's going to give us a shortcut and it's not part actually of the true genome. Something else that can happen is that if you, so this is the positive strand uh, of the genome, this is the negative strand, so this is the complementary part. Um, you can have also in the complementary part some reads that are similar to this one. And so you will create basically again a connection between the positive strand and the negative strand, which is, um, which is not good. So this is the first uh, issue. The second issue, which is actually uh, more challenging, is what they call segment duplication. So if we look at the genome, there are some parts that are actually uh, composed of uh, a lot of uh, small uh, repetitive regions, as you can see here. If the machine produces reads of this length, basically what we, it will be able to, to produce, the machine will only be able to produce this set of reads, and they are all the same. So this will create a tangle um, very hard actually for uh, you know to um, to, um, to 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 disentangle basically. Uh, so to this date, um, there is no genome assembler that can solve you know this, this issue. Uh, so the solution can be either um, you know having longer reads. So if you have like reads which are you know longer than this region, then you solve the problem. Or maybe better algorithm that will be able to untangle, you know, this um, this part of the uh, of the assembly graph. Okay, so for constructing the graph, if we look at, um, you know, uh, uh, like a brute force exact uh, comp uh, computation, so the complexity would be um, n square. So n is the number of reads. So we will need to look at for each read all of the reads, see if there is some uh, overlap. Okay. And we have d squared, so d is the dimensionality of the reads. So this is the number of base pairs in each read. So typically, for example, for IFA reads, you would get 20,000. So this number is too huge today for, for our computers. So for example, if you, if you, what I did is very simple computation is uh, you know, trying to do this um, uh, convolution operations, you know, just to look at um, the, the overlap. So this is actually, on the GPU, this is very fast uh, to do. You, it will take three hours. But you need to transfer all your reads from, from hard drive to the GPU memory. And this takes basically too much time. So this is not possible today 
maybe in 10 years, but it's not possible today to have an exact uh, construction of the assembly graph. So we need an approximation to construct the assembly graph. And today there are as many approximation as the number of genome assemblers. Okay. And, and of course, yeah, of course you have different types of, uh, of reads given from uh, different sequencing machine. So again, you will have different type of graph constructor for the different type of reads. So in summary, what I, what I want to say is basically, if you are looking at uh, the sequencing errors, the interspersed and duplicated regions, the approximation of the graph construction, this makes the topology of the assembly graphs very noisy. Uh, and for example, we have like multiple disconnected components. We have also cycles, we have dead ends, we have bubbles, we have transitive edges and tangles. So the, the topology of the graph is not clean. It's actually uh, very noisy. So that's, that's the first uh, challenge. Okay. So once we have the assembly graph, um, the next step is basically to extract um, the genome. So extracting the genome in this situation would be to solve um, a path routing problem inside uh, the assembly graph to extract the longest possible path on, on, on the graph. And this is equivalent to, find, to basically solving again uh, uh, a very hard problem. This is an NPR, uh, you know, combinatorial problem. So, so, but if we were able to do that, um, then the, the last step would be basically to concatenate. This, this so, um, any, I'm sorry, any, any question? Uh, oh, okay. So, okay. So, so um, assembly graphs, um, so it's very hard to, ex to extract, find, uh, to first extract, you know, a, a, a long, um, you know, the longest possible path. But even that, you know, even if we were able to do that, um, it's impossible because, because of the quality of the assembly graph. Remember that it's very noisy and it's not possible in basically, uh, you know, we cannot go through the whole um, graph uh, with a single pass. So the only thing we can do because the graph is disconnected is to extract uh, fragments of the genome and this is called contics. So they are like uh, small part of the genomes. And basically existing assemblers today, they, 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 the goal is to extract the best set of possible contics uh, in terms of length. So you want to have the, the longest possible, uh, uh, you know, contics and also in terms of uh, quality. So you want something which is, uh, when you reconstruct the genome, which is, um, um, uh, which has like no errors for the base pairs. Okay. So today the genome assemblers, they are basically based on uh, human engineered uh, heuristic. So the idea is you start from this very complex uh, graph, very noisy, and you try to simplify this graph, to sparsify this graph until you get very long sequences. So for example, um, here we, um, we use Ravens, um, so developed my, by my collaborators in this project. And Ravens uh, use a set of heuristics, um, which is listed here. Uh, so the first heuristic is basically to remove transitive uh, edges. So the idea is um, you will get um, theoretically, you know, the same solution if you, uh, if you, if you do this, um, you know, this path, if you do this path, if you do this path or if you do this path. But what we want is basically to take the longest possible path because it would mean that we would have a maximum um, you know, overlap between the reads. And then at the final step, we will have more overlap. So we will be able to um, get um, better, um, better denoising of the, um, of, of, of the, of the sequence uh, by majority voting. So we want to take you know, the longest possible path. This is the way to improve the, um, the reconstruction of the, to have the best possible reconstruction of the genome. 
Another, uh, the second uh, heuristic is to remove dead ends. So if you have, for example, this, this will go to a dead end. So uh, we want to remove this part. We also have bubbles. Um, and we want to remove, you know, in the bubbles, the shortest, um, the shortest path. We want to take, again, the longest possible path to have the maximum overlap between the reads. Um, then what we do to simplify the graph, uh, we are going to collapse sequences into like super nodes. This is called unitics. Another step is to do um, dimensionality reduction and see if there are some um, long uh, connections, like this one and this one. We want to remove them. Okay, so eventually we would get to something like this. We have here the regions where we have a lot of repetitions in the genome. We don't know how to solve this region. So basically, what we do is that we remove this tangle. And at the end, we have a set of contexts, so a set of uh, sequences. So this is how it is done um, in most um, uh, genome assembler uh, today. So our contribution. So if we look at the state of the art, so this is this year in 2022. So that was the first uh, gapless, uh, you know, human genome sequence. And what was, you know, the, the reasons of this success? Um, so first that was, um, you know, uh, we got better sequencing machines uh, with longer and more accurate reads. Um, then we can we can use a combination of multiple genome assemblers depending again on the on the type of the um, of the of the reads of, of the machines, uh, and at the end we have like um, uh, strong human experts that will perform manually, uh, you know, inspections to be able to resolve the tangles and assemble you know the context together. So um, uh, naturally, this is um, this is this is a very hard problem, and this is uh, you know for this solution. That was time in, and resource consuming. Uh, so it took uh, 1.5 years, and it was a large team of, of scientists, very um, uh, you know, uh, experts in this, uh, in this field. And this is not something that we can generalize to, let's say, you know, a million uh, genomes. So what do we propose? We naturally propose to have some machine learning paradigm. The idea is to use deep learning to reduce and replace human heuristics you know, by learned uh, heuristics. So the idea would be to have like, um, an AI-based genome assembler. And the advantage uh, coming from machine learning is basically we want to have, um, uh, we want to train uh, a genome assembler that would be independent of the sequencing machine. So that can be, uh, you know, PacBio, that can be Nanopore. Um, and then we also, we do not want to handcraft the rules to extract uh, the sequence from the assembly graph. Okay, so we want something that would be, um, universal to the machine. Uh, so that's that's the ultimate goal. So here we try to be uh, humble, uh, going step by step. So the for, for this work, um, we basically focus on the second part of the genome assembler, which is the path extraction part. So what we do is basically we use the existing, uh, an existing graph assembler, which is uh, given again by Raven. So this is by my collaborators. So this produces a graph, an assembly graph. And given this assembly graph, what we want is to train a network to extract uh, the longest possible uh, fraction of the genome. So again, the, the, the context. Of course, the, the quality of the, uh, of the graph, of the uh, genome, of, of, the, of the assembly graph has uh, an impact on the, uh, on the extraction of the context. But this is not what we are looking at here. Here we, we say, okay, we give uh, one um, good genome, um, um, uh, one good graph construction technique, and let's try to um, extract the best possible context uh, from there. So this is um, an overview of our uh, framework. Um, and I'm going to detail, uh, you know, uh, uh, these blocks uh, stay by step. Yeah. So first, the data set. So for the data set, we use the um, openly uh, uh, public uh, uh, human genome sequence. So this is the that was the first one. So this is called CHN13. Uh, this is uh, one female uh, haploid um, with 23 chromosomes and two strands. So it has 3.3 uh, billion base pair lengths. And the five million reads of the um, uh, PAC bio iFi 
uh, sequencing machine. Uh, we improve a little bit this data set by um, correcting the um, some works in the reads uh, by using uh, IFISM. And we also map the reads um, by IFI reads to the genome sequence um, to, uh, to look at you know, some kind of ground truth solution. Okay. So in this project to do machine learning, we will need to do data augmentation. Uh, we need to do the documentation for, uh, to reduce overfitting and, and also we know for better generalization. For this, we are going to use a simulator of reads, of artificial reads, with the constraint that the distribution of the artificial reads lengths will be the same as the real uh, read lengths. Okay. Um, why we do that? We do that because basically what we want to do, we want to create, we want to simulate an arbitrary number of train and validation assembly graphs uh, for training our network um, with more data. So, so this is this is why we want to have more assembly graphs. So, given the CHM13 um, genome reference, what we will do is that we will create for each chromosome a set of simulated reads. Okay, and for testing, we will use the the real um, IFI reads. Okay, and then for um, for training our network, um, what we will do in this work, we decided to do supervised learning. So for supervised learning, we need some labels, and the labels that we are going to use are basically positional information. So we have the the genome or the chromosome, and because we simulate um, we simulate um, the reads, basically, we know exactly the position of each read uh, on the chromosome or, uh, or, the, or, or the genome. So for example, this is the first read, this is the second read, this is the third read, this is the fourth read. So this positional information will be very important to train our network to be able to reconstruct the, the, the genome sequence. And this on, will only be used during, of course, training. And during testing, we will not use any kind of positional information. But this is where we get our training signal. OK. So as I said before, here we, 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 are, we use basically um, uh, a graph construction technique, which is uh, Raven. And, and, and Raven is basically composed of two steps. Uh, so the idea is first you need to do some dimensionality reduction of your reads. So at the beginning your reads is twenty thousand dimensions. This is the number of base pairs, and there is a way to reduce that to, for example, five, uh, five twelve dimensions with um, what they call k-mers. So it's a kind of uh, repetitive words that you have, um, you know, inside the, the reads. Then from from this uh, from these words they are using they use. Um, technique to um, find the um, pairwise matching between the uh, between the reads, um, and at the end, the, um, for example, the computational time for a chromosome of fifty thousand reads we take twenty minutes uh, using uh, thirty threads. And so this is what we use. So we have the uh, the chromosome reads. We use Raven, and this gives us you know uh, training graphs. And we will do also the same for the real reads. We will use Raven to construct the test uh, graph. OK. So once we have the graph, again, we need to do decoding. We need to extract the path on the graph that is going to reconstruct the genome sequence. Um, so first of all, because again, we are doing supervised uh, learning, we need to have some uh, labeling of the edges. So some edges are going to be uh, are going to be correct. For example, all the red edges uh, are correct. So if we follow this path, uh, this path, this path, then we will be able to reconstruct the genome. But some of the edges will be actually wrong. So if we follow this path and the blue um, the blue uh, uh, edges, then we will go to a dead end and we will not be able to reconstruct um, the genome. And if we do this, um, if we follow this path here, basically, 
again, we will shortcut um, a huge part of the genome and we will not be able to reconstruct the genome. So how do we label the, uh, the, the, the edges uh, to, be, uh, to be correct? And we will give the value one if it is correct or to be wrong. And we will give the value zero if it is wrong. So again, we are going to use the positional information to do that. So we, we are going to use the positional information and we are going to do some um, search algorithms. So we will start for example from here. We will uh, do, for example, in this case, a depth first search algorithms. If we go to Sunday dance, then we will be able to come back here. Okay, we will note this edge as zero. And then we will just continue the search. Uh, if we have some very long connections, because we will be able to look at the position of this node of, and the position of this node, we will know that this will be uh, a wrong uh, edge, and then we will put zero. Okay, so this is again given by the positional information. Um, so you you can observe that um, most of the edges are actually correct. Uh, for most of them, uh, you would get you know the, uh, you can follow them and you would get uh, a solution. But the issue is basically there are some critical. Um, some critical nodes uh, that will give you a very bad, uh, bad solution, and 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 we we want to avoid this uh, this bad um, uh, these bad nodes. Okay. Okay. So now, um, how can we predict um, the the edge, the link that will lead to um, the the good, uh, the extraction of 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 the genome? So how we do that? So we need a network architecture to do that. And so from the beginning, uh, we could see that actually the, um, this um, genome assembly task is basically a graph problem. So um, the, when we have you know, overlapping uh, reads, then we have uh, naturally a graph of the reads. And then when we want to extract uh, the genome, basically we need to solve uh, a path uh, searching uh, algorithm on a, on, on a graph. Okay. So, so what kind of network can we use? So uh, we cannot use CNN because CNN works with grids. RNN is going to work for sequences. Okay. Um, we, we cannot use transformer because transformer works for fully connected graphs. And, and here the assembly graphs that we, are, uh, that we use are basically uh, a sparse graph. It has very um, special um, class of uh, uh, of, uh, of connectivity, so it's, it's not fully connected. So naturally, we will need to use graph neural network uh, to solve this, this task. Okay. So the goal is basically to design um, a GNN that is um, expressive enough, powerful enough for solving the, um, um, the, assembly, um, the assembly task. So when you design a GNN, you need some properties. So for example, you want your um, network to be invariant, equivariant, in the sense that if I'm looking at, so H is the um, representation of the node, uh, E is the representation of, of, of an edge. So you want basically uh, your representation to be independent of the indexing of the nodes. So indexing of the nodes is arbitrary uh, in your computer. If you change the indexing, you don't want to change the representation because you will not be able to generalize. Okay, so generalization comes from the fact that we don't care how we store the graph, how we index the graph, um, the representation will always be the same. The second thing is that we want to be independent of the size of the neighborhood. So we can have, you know, two neighbors, we can have 100 neighbors. We want the, the, the network to be independent of, of this size. And the same also, you may have, you know, uh, you know, chromosomes of uh, 50,000 reads, chromosome of 200 reads, you still want, you know, your GNN to be independent of the size of the graph. Um, here, you can see there are like directions. So you need to have some kind of um, anisotropic convolution um, operation on your, uh, on your network, and I will come back to that. And you also want your local resolution field to be uh, directed. Uh, deep architecture, naturally. And then there is something that I'm going to back. Uh, I'm, I'm going back to that, which is uh, we want to break the node anonymity uh, on assembly graphs. Okay. So, 
So the, the GNN that we designed for, for this task, and um, we cannot use like um, a vanilla GNN. We need something a little more advanced uh, to solve this problem. So we tried something very simple at the beginning. It didn't work. So the one at the end that, that we used is uh, based on um, uh, a work we, we have done uh, in the past, which, which is Getty GCN. And we adapted basically this uh, Getty GCN for, uh, for this uh, special class of, of graphs. Um, so what you have here, this is basically, um, so this Getty GCN was um, basically inspired by um, image processing. So in image processing, um, there was um, uh, some time ago, uh, you know, uh, PDEs to denoise images. So for example, when you want, if your image has some noise, you want to denoise your image and um, you also want to preserve edges inside your image. So you need to have some kind of anisotropic diffusion uh, 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 on your image domain. And, and one of the very uh, powerful um, techniques to do that was the Perron Amalic. So what you have here is basically uh, the generalization of Perron Amalic um, to discretize to graphs. And what I wanted to do that is basically because we have here some natural, um, uh, again, anisotropic uh, diffusion property. So um, what you have here is, uh, is a kind of, um, uh, this, is, this is where you get the, the, anisotropy, uh, the anisotropic property. So this is, uh, today we can call that uh, a gate. And this is a directed edge gate. Um, this will be for, for, from J to I. So this will be for incoming um, edges. And this part will be for the outgoing uh, edges. Um, but what you have here is, is really a diffusion process um, on, on a graph. So that's, that's the only difference with Peron Amalic is that here we use the trick of machine learning where we can uh, learn the diffusion coefficient so the matrix A1, A2, and A3, um, they are learned by backpropagation. And we use also the trick of batch normalization, uh, you know, nonlinear uh, activations. And, and this, um, the residual connection actually uh, come, appears completely naturally because this is when you discretize your PD. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is the model. So here you have the node, um, the node update. Uh, of your of your graph, and here you're going to have the age update. Okay, um, and and you see that everything is coupled. So when you update the node, this will have an influence on the edge, and when you update the edge, this will have an influence on on the node. So this is a coupled uh, PDE. Okay, so the model is uh, permutation invariant. This is what I said before: is that if you apply any permutation matrix on the indexing. Uh, you will not change uh, basically the representation of the nodes. Uh, also something um, important is that you can see right away that this equation is local. So you can do all this operation locally uh, in the neighborhood, uh, in the one hop neighborhood uh, of, your, of your node i. And this means that basically uh, you can distribute uh, this computation over you know, big graphs. And Today, so we have some um, uh, very good, uh, you know, libraries to do that, uh, such as uh, Deep Graph libraries, so from Amazon and PyTorch Geometric from Stanford. Um, yeah, and and here we use uh, we use DGL. The other thing is, so we uh, because the graph is directed, uh, we we have uh, a local reception field for the incoming age and for the outgoing uh, age. So having two, um, two uh, reception fields also give us more parameters that we can learn. So this increased the um, expressivity power of, of GNN. OK, so of course, the architecture given by batch normalization is the connection. And then let me talk about the non-anonymity here. OK, so what are the input uh, features for this? Uh, for this problem. So for the edge feature, uh, what we would get is basically, so if we are looking at you know, two reads, uh, we are looking at the overlap. And the, the feature is basically the length of the overlap between two reads. 
and also the quality. So um, if there is no error, then you will get 100%. If there is 5% error, you will get 95% uh, error. Okay. Now for the done features, um, in this work, actually, we did not use any node feature. Okay, we just uh, did what was in Raven. Um, they didn't use any node feature. Everything was completely topological. But of course, we could use some, you know, we could extract some information from the raw reads, uh, for example, using, uh, you know, um, a CNN or, um, or a transformer. And that's, this is part of our future work. But in this, in this project, in these results I'm going to show you, there is actually no node feature. There is like nothing. So this is actually um, a theoretical problem for GNN. When all the nodes are, doesn't have any unique identity, um, basically the GNN um, is going to perform poorly. And the reason of that is because um, there are many um, symmetry in graphs. So the GNN uh, is going to be lost uh, you know, to predict this, uh, you know, in this part of the graph, uh, what would be the right uh, next edge, or in this part of the right to predict the, the, the same, uh, uh, another, you know, edge. Um, because the two parts of the graph should be different, but the, the, the GNN is not able to distinguish these two parts. So it's confused and is going to give like a random um, prediction. So you need, uh, theoretically, to have some node identity for your or your nodes. Um, so the way we solved this problem before was to give some graph positional encoding. So for example, if you have an undirected graph, something that works pretty well is the Laplacian eigenvectors. So the Laplacian eigenvectors give us some natural coordinate system of your graph. And then suddenly, you are able to um, know which part of the graph you know the GNN uh, is doing the job. For directed graph, uh, the one that we used um, was uh, page rank, and we use like a case step of page rank um, to to get some um, good graph positional encoding, and we also use the in degree and the out degree. So page rank and and the degree are basically uh, equivalent, which means that um, they are independent of the indexing of the graph. And again, this is very important if you want to generalize to new graphs. You want something which doesn't depend on on the indexing of the nodes. Okay. So uh, now we can, uh, we can start doing um, um, the, um, the forward pass of the, of the GNN. So the first step is basically, so we take the uh, input um, node feature, the input uh, edge feature. We just project them into a higher uh, dimensional space uh, using a standard MLP. And then we just perform um, L, uh, L convolutional layers by updating the node and the edge. Uh, representations. Okay, so once we have done L convolutional layers, now we have a good representation of the nodes and the edges. So now we can solve the task. So the task here is basically to predict if uh, a directed edge, for example, from this one to this one, there is actually you know um, a connection or not. So the way we predict is simple. We just do a concatenation of the um, of the node i representation, the node k representation, and the h uh, i k. We, we concatenate, we do an MLP, and then we do sigmoid. So this would give us a probability uh, of you know, having a connection between the node i and the node k. OK. For training, so we used uh, 16 layers and 256 uh, dimensions. So this gives us a network of 6.5 million parameters, and the training is done simply by, um, you know, uh, by cross entropy because we know uh, um, by using the positional information if this edge uh, is uh, part of the solution or not. So we can train the network. Uh, optimization is done by stochastic gradient descent with uh, Adam optimizer. Uh, okay, the size of the graph. So here you're going to see that we focused um, on chromosomes. So the size of chromosome graphs are basically between 32,000 to uh, 184,000 nodes. So for this graph, uh, basically, uh, they are too big to fit um, the GPU memory. So we need to partition the graph. And the way we do that, we need something very fast. We use Metis, um, which, is, um, um, which is a clustering algorithm based on balance cut. 
And, and what we do is that um, we, we give a different number of cluster at each epoch to force um, having different clusters at each epoch. So this is the way also we can uh, give a little more generalization to our uh, technique. OK. So we have the, uh, we have the graph neural network to make uh, a prediction. Now let's do the decoding. So again, the decoding is um, you know, finding a path um, on a graph. And the way we are going to do it is um, in an autoregressive way. So selecting one node at a time. And this is very standard. So you, you have you know, the probability of the sequence. And you can factorize your probability by, by using the chain rule. So it's basically the product of um, you know, if you are the node uh, uh, at the iteration t of using what happened before. And of course, this probability, this conditional probability, is given by the graph, uh, the graph network. So in this work, we used uh, something very simple. We just um, uh, did greedy uh, uh, decoding because it's very fast uh, to do. So at each node, uh, basically, uh, we are going to select the probability uh, of the next, uh, the next edge, uh, which has the highest uh, value. Okay. So that's it. Um, so the way was, uh, so remember that the graph assembly is very noisy. So it has multiple connected components. Um, you know, the topology is not so nice. So what we do is that we, we do not only extract one path. What we decided to do is to extract k path. And because it's greedy, it's very quick to do. And so what we do is that we use Bernoulli sampling on the edge probability. Uh, to select the top and not only the top uh, probability. And we extract k initial edges. And then we, we just uh, decode, you know, uh, pass forward on the, um, uh, on the assembly graph and then pass backward on the assembly graph. And then we have uh, a path. So we do that for k path. And at the end, we select the longest path. Once we have this longest path, we just mark the nodes um, on the graph that have been visited. And then we iterate this process. So we go to the next extraction phase, where we extract again uh, you know, k path. We select the longest path. We mark the nodes. And we keep going until you know, the length of the, um, of the path is below a threshold. And then we stop. Basically. OK. So now let's talk about the numerical, numerical experiment. So in this work, uh, first of all, we did not um, evaluate our technique on the whole genome. So because that was the first step, what we wanted to do is to um, have some um, promising results. And we did it on chromosomes. Basically, we, we use one chromosome in this, uh, in this work for training. And all the remaining chromosomes will be for testing. For this chromosome, so this is the chromosome 19, so there is actually uh, nothing particular <laughs> about this chromosome 19. So we try with uh, you know, other chromosomes. The results are more or less the same. Um, so for this um, training chromosome, we generate 15 synthetic uh, training graphs and three validation graphs. Okay? We train the network um, on, this, um, uh, on this chromosome. And we select the network with the lowest validation loss. So it took uh, less than one hour on, on, this, uh, on this NVIDIA uh, GPU. Um, and then, then when the network is ready, we can do inference. So then we try on um, real, um, real chromosomes. And we just do forward pass. We get the probability of the edges. And then we do greedy decoding to extract uh, the context so the different parts of the genomes. OK. So for the evaluation measure, um, we, we used uh, standard quality measures in this, in this domain. So um, we, we have, for example, the number of contexts. Uh, so how many extracted parts uh, are we able to get from the, uh, from, uh, from the chromosome? Um, so uh, lower is better. Uh, we want the longest possible uh, you know. Um, uh, sequence, so we don't want to have fraction, so the lower the better. We have also the longest contig, so what is the longest, uh, 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 what is the size of the longest contig? Higher is better. We also want to look at, you know, the genome fraction that we are able to recover. So at the end, when we have the path, you know, we uh, concatenate uh, all reads, 
and then we look at you know uh, we map uh, this to the to the genome and we see you know how much percentage of the genome we are able to reconstruct. Uh, then there is this measure, NG50. So the way it works is basically um, they put all the contexts, you know, uh, in an order way, and then look at, you know, 50%, and they take the, the, the size of the, uh, of the contexts in this 50%. They, there is also NGA50. So when you have the genome available, like, like, like we have, uh, we just take the 50% of the, of the genome. And, and then we, we report you know, the size of this, uh, of this context. And finally, we have the base error. So this is the number of mis mismatches and inders. So this is when you, you get insertions and deletions. And the lower, the better. All right. So um, now, um, in, this, uh, in this table, here you're going to have the, um, uh, so the, the learned uh, heuristic to extract uh, the genome sequence. So this is given by the graph neural network. And here you have the heuristic, um, the human engineering heuristic by Raven. And something which is in bold means, means better. So you can see if we look at you know, different uh, measures like the number of contexts, the longest contexts, uh, NGA50, um, uh, and, and the, the percentage of graph uh, of, of the genome reconstructed, uh, basically, um, you know, the learn heuristics is able to perform better than, than the, uh, the, the human engineering heuristics. And this is, all this is also true for mismatch and, and indoor. Okay, so, so these um, experimental results, um, I think they, they demonstrate the potential of deep learning to solve the genome assembly uh, problem. So, of course, uh, here, what we did is basically we, we decided to use um, a state-of-the-art a state of the art genome assembler with Raven. And, and from this, we, we learn um, you know, the heuristics with a GNN, and we show that it outperformed the human, um, the human rules. So this is, this, is a, this is a proof of concept. Uh, it's just the beginning, a first step. But of course, again, there is this, um, you know, uh, this long-term objective is basically to make everything end to end. So, um, so yeah. So we released um, uh, everything uh, on GitHub. Uh, there is the genomic data set. Uh, the data set is available. Um, we also have the um, denoise hi-fi reads. Uh, we have also the positional information. We have all the graphs of uh, real chromosomes. And also, that's it. I think this is also very nice for the GNN community because um, they are like real world uh, graphs um, uh, large enough, and and uh, the task is something uh, very important. Okay, so there are some statistics. So if you would like to uh, to have more information later, um, so the next steps uh, for us is to um, first check that um, so the the GNN. Um, is something that can be used for any kind of graph constructors. So we use um, Raven, but today, actually, the state of the art is by IFISM. So IFISM has the best uh, you know, assembly graph. And this is what we are working on today, is to um, basically use the IFISM graph and train a GNN from this graph and see if we can do better than the, um, the heuristic given by IFISM to extract the path. So this is what, what we are working on. Also, what, what we want to do is to evaluate not only on the individual chromosomes, we want to evaluate on the whole genome. So that's, that's something which is much more important. We want to be able to reconstruct uh, the whole genome. We also want to uh, evaluate on two haploids simultaneously. So the, um, the public data set, CMH13, is actually a single haploid coming from the mother. We want, uh, and this is, a, this is a project that is being developed in Singapore, is basically we want to evaluate, uh, once we have this uh, genome assembler, we want to evaluate um, on, on many possible genomes. So there is a, a national um, program here in Singapore um, with the Genome Institute uh, of Singapore, which is basically trying to sequence uh, between 100,000 to 1 million genomes from, from the Singapore community, where basically there is three ethnicities, uh, Chinese, Indian, uh, and Malaysian. And, and basically, 
uh, trying to construct a pan genome of uh, of uh, of this uh, of this group. So that that would be something um, quite interesting to do. Uh, of, of course, evaluate on non-human uh, genomes. And something for the machine learning part, which is uh, uh, very exciting, is okay. Uh, today I presented a technique to um, to learn to extract the path from uh, an assembly graph, but also what we want to do, and we are working on that, is also to train and to end the graph construction and the uh, the path extraction. So we want to do ev make everything um, you know end to end um, in a machine learning way. Um, so that would be something um, complete. That would be a complete uh, AI uh, genome assembler. Uh, 